Perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, uh, today, I'm I'm going to talk um, about something that might not look like it really belongs together: password reset forms and and missing people. And but bear with me, and I'm gonna walk you through that uh, a little bit. There's also some good tips for red teamers in here at the end, and uh, some tips for blue teamers. So if you're not just into OSINT investigations, there is some uh, good stuff at the end, and hopefully. It's going to be an enjoyable talk uh, just uh, for, for your general interest. All right. So a little bit of a background on me. Uh, we already talked about some of these things. Um, the way I got into kind of looking for missing people uh, was uh, through two things, really. One is Trace Labs, which is an organization that takes uh, missing people cases, uh, takes submissions from the uh, from the law enforcement community, and then crowdsources all of that to uh, get the, the hacker community to help uh, find these missing people. Really, really interesting work. They have competitions, and they also have ongoing cases if you prefer to just do it in your own time by yourself. Uh, I've also uh, been joining the uh, National Child Protection Task Force as an advisor. So that's a, uh, an organization that's that trains law enforcement officers on how to use OSINT, particularly for child exploitation cases, uh, online predators, those kinds of things. And the same kind of uh, methods apply here, really. I've been working in marketing and cybersecurity for a while. So some of the companies I worked for include PGP and Rapid7, and right now Veracode. But my ultimate life goal is to acquire all the cool skills from heist movies and con artistry movies and to get an internship with a fortune teller. So if there's anybody in the audience who can uh, sort me out with any of those, that would be good. In the meantime, I'll be uh, joining, uh, shortly I'll be joining HD Moore as a co-founder in his startup uh, that you can find at rumble.run. Seems the world's running out of top level domains. Uh, and if you're into network discovery, um, I highly encourage you to check that out. They have a um, free trial and uh, community edition. All right. So forgetting passwords, the forgot password function. Um, so it, you, you may have seen uh, that some forget password functions are you know, in the standard kind of operating manual for some OSINT, OSINT investigations. But typically, they only cover Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and they uh, cover very little beyond that. And there is a lot of nuances that, that they don't cover. Um, some of the problems are that people sometimes get notified, so it's tricky to use. And since I submitted this talk, Trace Labs, for example, has actually disallowed the password resets for the competitions because they don't want uh, you know, 400 people to send a password request that notifies a family that has a missing uh, missing person, right? Um, you're supposed to do any of that without contacting anybody uh, of the of the family or anybody at all. But the practical application is still valid in a lot of cases. If you're not doing this for a Trace Labs competition, uh, I highly encourage you to try this out. Um, be careful because some of those things uh, alert the target. I pulled uh, on a thread when I when I did this, and I uh, I think my bio is not, not my bio. The, the talk says that I, I inventoried about uh, 300 sites. I think the my spreadsheet has grown to about 500 sites, where I looked at you know the login forms and the password resource forms and signups and so on. Where are they leaking information that could be useful from an OSINT perspective? And so what I'm showing in this. Uh, presentation are some of the really most interesting things and how you'd use that in uh, an OSINT investigation. So uh, a quick legal disclaimer, really important. I'm not a lawyer. Um, take nothing what I say here as legal advice and check that what uh, you're about to do is legal in your jurisdiction. I'm not suggesting with any of the, these methods that you actually try to log into an account of somebody else. Um, that would be illegal in most jurisdictions, so uh, please be warned. The, the primary sources for leaks I looked at were three things, um, login forms, uh, password resets, and sign-up pages. So on the login form, for example, 
you can test if an email exists in a lot of cases, right? Exists on that platform. Does that account exist? Um, some sites, um, uh, it, many sites actually do that, and we'll see uh, one example in this in this presentation. Uh, password resets, those reveal some of the most interesting information. We'll see that uh, in, the, in the next section. Uh, it's not a lot of sites, but there are still a fair amount of sites that really leak information there and some interesting sites. And then sign up pages. So um, if, if neither the login nor the password reset actually gives you uh, the information on whether an account exists with a certain email address, the sign up page in most cases actually does that. So if you just try to sign up with your target's email address and it says, oh, this account exists already, then you know that uh, this account exists on the platform. Obviously, that has some challenges because if you do that once, you're creating an account and the next person doing that test then gets a false positive. The types of information that is leaked are whether an account exists, uh, you see a lot of masked email addresses and phone numbers. We'll have a look at how to unmask those. Usernames, names, masked credit card numbers, and even employers. When you do any of these techniques, what I recommend is, so for example, I talked about Facebook earlier. Let's say you're logged into Facebook. right? You'd have to log out of Facebook before you can uh, log back in and press the forgot password function. So what I encourage you to do when you're trying out these kinds of methods is go to uh, the incognito um, mode of your browser, which is essentially the same as logging you out of your browser, but it doesn't, um, you know, isn't isn't connected with all the hassle of actually logging out. So that's a, a neat way to to speed up your investigation. All right, some of the um, vendors that I, I looked at or websites I uh, tried to redact. Um, I, I can redact the names. It's really hard to redact the branding. So uh, some of you may may recognize which e-commerce e company this is. Um, I did not redact all of them uh, because some of the well-known examples I, I, I thought didn't, didn't make a lot of sense. But this is an e-commerce company, well-known one. And this is an example of how the sign-in function, the login function, actually leaks information. So if I type in a, an email address that does not exist and click on Continue, then it says here on the top right, uh, sorry, on the top, that there was a problem because the account doesn't exist. You'll find this in a lot of sign-in uh, screens that have one where you type in the email or the um, or the phone number, actually, which can also be really useful. If you've got a phone number in an investigation but not the email, you can test with that. Uh, yeah, if you have a, a the, 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 call kind of the username or an identifying feature of the user, email address, phone number on one screen, and then a continue, and then typing in the password, this usually works. It also works in some cases when there is uh, both username and password on the same page. Now, if we uh, try to log on with a real email address that exists on this platform, then the message is different. You don't get the warning message, and you're being asked for the password. Now, in this case, the person isn't being notified right? on, on this site, for example. Uh, because, and it's quite unusual that they be notified in this case. The notification usually happens either with a password reset or for sure with a logon, sorry, with a sign-up form. Uh, because they usually want to um, do an, uh, an opt-in verification of the email. So that's an example of a login forum. Let's have a look at the, uh, uh, at the next example. Facebook, I didn't redact because Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram are pretty well documented, but there are some nuances that are worth calling out. So for Facebook, you know, go into the incognito uh, window of your browser and then click on Forgot Account. And you see here that it actually says, please enter your email or phone number to search your account. Right, So you can do either email or phone number. What's interesting is that many sites that have a password reset function accept more types of input than they actually say on the page. So the Facebook password reset, for example, also works with a, um, a Facebook ID or the username. And the username is actually the, 
part of the URL. So you can find that pretty easily. So let's say we're taking a username, we're plugging that in in the example, and I redacted some of the email addresses in, in these examples. So what you get back is um, a masked email address and a masked phone number and an image and a name. Right. So coming from the username, the image, and the name, you, you can already tell if you just go to the profile, if you have the profile name. But the masked email address and the phone number are new pieces of information. Now, with, uh, with Facebook, I've seen that sometimes this process notifies the account holder. Most of the time, it doesn't. But I haven't found a reliable way to tell in advance when it does and when it doesn't. If anybody in the audience out there knows the answer to this, I would love to know that. Uh, please DM me on Twitter or contact me on Discord. Uh, or share it with uh, people in the audience here later as a, as a question or a comment. So now we have, we have these pieces of information that, that we get. right? And for, set, for many sites, I found that the number of stars actually corresponds with the number of characters that are being masked out. And that's super helpful. Facebook is one of those sites. So you know that there is, you know, in this case, five characters missing in that email address. And that really helps you guess the right email address. So let's say that you um, started out with uh, an account on Facebook called john.do, and you do the password reset function. right? And you get an email back that says, you know, j star 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 e at aol.com, and a phone ending in the number 25. right? So um, in many, many cases, you can guess what that email address is. And now here we would guess maybe it's john.do at aol.com. could be John Doe without the dot and so on. So there's different variants. But whatever you're guessing, you just you know, go back, do the same password reset function. And instead of the username, this time you plug in the email address. And you hit the password reset function. And it'll tell you, um, do you want to reset to your email or do you want to reset to the phone? And it's this, uh, and it displays the phone number. If the last two digits of the phone number are the same, then you're dead certain that it's the same. Well, pretty certain that you're the same. It's the same account, but it's a very, very good indicator. There's also some other ways of of guessing the account. This is from a, a real case that I tried to obfuscate a little bit. So um, the, we found a Facebook profile that was essentially something like Jeanette.do.9 uh, as a username. We ran that through the reset function, and we got something like this back. Um, and, and it's kind of hard to guess, like, what is that? What, what does that look like, right? And we thought, OK, this could be maybe like a school or university address or something like that. So we looked at on Facebook at all of the schools that this, this was a teenager, all the schools that this teenager had been at. And this was the school website. So then uh, we went to Dehashed and said, all right, give me all the breached, pass or breached uh, email addresses for this domain. And we found out that the, the format is for students is, uh, three letters of the first name, then full last name, at stu.irvingisd.net. And so then we took that, and we kind of used that same Jeanette first three, and then the last name, Doe, right? at, and then the rest of the domain, plugged that back into the Facebook password reset, and we uh, unmasked the name. So you can, you can use these kind of techniques. Another way to unmask the email address is uh, through uh, password breach sites. So several of these sites allow you to uh, put in wildcards. So this is the format for dehashed. Um, for example, here, um, if you say email colon, and I, I just did a fictitious one. This is not an actual uh, person we were investigating. I just picked something at random. June question mark, question mark, those are two characters, right? 78, and domain colon gmail.com, right? So that means I'm looking for an email address that's june something something 78 at gmail.com. 
And I, I got back a full list that's a little longer, but you see at the bottom here that it came back with junelu78 at gmail.com. You can also put a star in for uh, many characters, uh, and the question mark is for one character. If you have a domain that gives you one character, one star per character as a, as a mask, then you want to use the question mark here. Uh, the other service that I found um, um, that allows wildcard searches in breach data is uh, Dark Owl, a, a dark web search engine. So that one works as well. And I believe they, they use stars. I'm not sure if they use question marks, uh, but you can check that in their documentation. But I thought Dehashed would be probably the more popular site in, in this crowd here. Let's have a look at Twitter. So for Twitter, um, again, it says email, phone number, or username. right? So you can plug any of the three in. Um, consider that when you have different types of input that you're looking for. And sometimes what you want to do is you have an email address, and, you just, and it, maybe you can't find uh, the, the profile on the site. If you plug that in and it says, would you like to reset, then you know that there is a profile on Twitter.com. And you, you can either use OSINT to search harder, or uh, if you work in law enforcement, you can follow the legal process and uh, uh, submit a subpoena to, to Twitter.com, for example, and saying, like, hey, I would like to know which account belongs to this email address. And they will, uh, they will send that back. So with uh, Twitter, very similar process. Um, you get a masked uh, email address and a phone number. Uh, the email address is masked in a different way. So you get uh, not just the first and the last of the uh, thing before the at, but you get the second first two letters, which can sometimes help. Uh, you don't get the full domain, but you get that from Facebook. And Twitter uh, doesn't alert the user unless you click Continue here. right? So when I say it doesn't alert, it's always if you don't follow through the whole process. If you click here, of course, they're going to get a text message or an email. So if you combine Twitter and Facebook information, now you have, like, if you add Twitter, you have one more character, uh, providing that they use the same email address for, for both. Another interesting thing is sometimes when you're investigating people, uh, especially if they, uh, you know, maybe in some hate crime cases, maybe in some uh, prostitution cases, and so on, um, their account has been suspended under the rules of the platform. So uh, password resets can also help you there. And this is not part of an investigation. I just uh, googled for a random suspended account uh, to show the method. So here. Uh, T. Cola Rose is the account. I only see the username. I don't see a picture. Account suspended. I can't see any tweets. Right. But now, if I go and say I want to reset my password on Twitter, I can plug in the username, and it'll give me this. It'll give me a uh, not the username, but I, I guess the clear name, right? Or what, whatever they had as a clear name on the profile. I get an image. And I get a phone number, a masked phone number, and a masked email address. And this starts with a G. Usually, that's gmail.com. right? That's a very, very common one. And uh, so what I was interested in, I, I thought, like, OK, the, the image is a, is a new pivot point that we didn't have from the suspended Twitter profile. So um, I right click on the image and open that image in a new tab. And it's tiny. right? It's a thumbnail. doesn't really help me. Right. Well, it helps a little bit, but it's, it's hard to see. And then uh, look at the URL. The, the picture, the JPEG, has a, a, a UID and then underscore normal dot JPEG. So just out of a whim, I removed the underscore normal, and I get a, a full res picture. And then I do a uh, reverse image search, just right click, say, search Google 4. And it finds a whole bunch of accounts with the same image. And uh, this account here is in adult work. I'm not sure if, if she's an escort or if she's in, uh, in adult movies or whatever. Sounds like something like that. So if this was an investigation, now you'd already have, uh, you'd have additional pivot points you know, with a picture that you didn't have before and so on. 
uh, in this case, I didn't go after the phone number and the email address, but you, you get the picture, right? Um, actually, you literally get the picture uh, that, that you can use the password reset function for more than just the, uh, the mask email and phone number. All right, let's have a look at Instagram. This is an example uh, where you can plug in the username, I believe also email address and phone number. Uh, and when you click that, this status bar pops up super quickly at the bottom of the screen and then goes away. So you need to be very fast to screenshot that. Uh, Instagram is an example that has a few disadvantages. So for example, um, the stars do not correspond to the number of characters. And the user is always notified. And it doesn't give you more information than Facebook. So if you have Facebook and Instagram, you're getting far enough with Facebook, take that, right? It's a better option. Uh, all right. Let's do some other examples. Now we're back in, the, uh, in some of the uh, redacted sites that I found that uh, were really powerful in the, in, the, in the kind of information that they give you. So this is for a, a phone company. And so when you're investigating somebody, it's usually fairly easy to find their home address and phone number and those kind of things. So here, for the password reset function, uh, the company allows you to plug in the phone number, and then you click Continue. Uh, it echoes the last four digits of the phone number that you just entered, so this is not new information. And then it asks you the, for the five-digit uh, billing zip code. Uh, you can figure that out from white pages pretty quickly if you don't have that already. So that's the only other information that you need. And then you click Next, and it gives you a, a masked uh, email address uh, with the complete domain name. So that uh, gives you some advantages. Another example, uh, and this one I, I found surprising because this is for a payments company. Um, so a site that probably gets a lot of phishing for its users and is probably quite security aware. So I was very surprised to see all the information that they're leaking here. So let's say uh, you want to uh, get to uh, this here. I think this also works with a with a phone number on a different screen, but uh, this example is for an email. So plug in the email, and uh, it echoes the email um, here. If you plug in the phone number, I think it also echoes an email. So you can convert that. It convert, confirms the last two digits of the credit card number on file, uh, which I thought, you know, for most applications, you need the last four. But the last two might also or, or already be enough if you're doing a vishing or phishing attempt against this target might give you enough information uh, to gain their trust by just you know, telling them what the last two digits of the credit card number on file is. Uh, and you also get um, the first digit of the area code and the last four of the phone number, uh, which is a lot more than you get on most of the other sites, where you only get the last two digits of the phone number. Conveniently, the same payments company also says, oh, um, you forgot your password, and you don't even know which email address you registered with us. Well, here is a screen where you can conveniently put in three email addresses, and it will tell you which one has an account with us. So I found that that really interesting. And also, what I found interesting that especially larger companies that have a lot of disparate systems sometimes have several password reset functions in different parts of their site. So make sure that you really follow the breadcrumbs and, and have a close look. All right, this one here is a payroll company. So something that your employer would sign you up for and that you get your pay stub through. So here, the forgot password function requires first name and last name, which you probably know about your target, either an email or a phone number. One of those you probably have. And uh, then on the next screen, it gives you the employers that are on file for that person. If you're dealing with somebody who is an adult who's uh, disappeared um, and you can't find their employment on LinkedIn, but you want to locate them, you know, like let's say in a skip tracing case or in a, uh, in a missing person case, you could find their current employer through 
through this if they are uh, processing through this payroll company. And, and this is, uh, I believe, by far the largest payroll company in the US. So your hit rate will probably be pretty good. Uh, if you go past the screen, you alert the account holder. So be careful with that. If you can, always test uh, if you have your own account with whatever company you're testing. Always test whether it alerts uh, and, and at what screen. So if we go beyond that, we're comfortable with alerting the target. We now also get the not only uh, the name and the employer, but we also find the username that's on file uh, to log on to this payroll company uh, for that user, for that employer. So that gives you either um, an edge if you want to get into uh, the, the payroll company, into that account, or if your target is excuse me, the employer company, where you're trying to figure out what's the internal username, especially if it's not you know, first.last or initial last name and so on. If it's something more complex, and the bigger companies usually have that, this is a good way of actually figuring out what's the user ID for that user. Uh, there's another link here. Uh, and it says, I don't know my password. right? And I thought, hmm, weird. I thought I already did like a. I uh, already looked at, um, at password reset, but maybe I didn't dig far enough. So I clicked that one. And yeah, so here I find um, you know, all the emails on file, not just one, but uh, with a full top level domain, and the last four of the phone number. Um, so again, last four of the phone number, some give you uh, some other parts of the phone number. Um, if you have several sources like this, you can piece together a lot and then do a, a, a search on some of the breach sites or, or guess, and uh, you can unmask the full information pretty quick. All right, so uh, some uh, cautions. I mentioned this, I think, three times already, but some of these sites do alert. Um, the account holder, so be careful. Uh, Sign-up forms uh, can work fantastically well the first time, but they impact future investigations. So make sure that if you're working on something that other people in your organization or other organizations would also uh, work on and try out, then you can actually negatively impact their results and uh, check the legality in your jurisdiction. All right. I've, I've brought with me two cases today um, that I didn't redact. Uh, I thought about, OK, how can I redact this and so on? Uh, they're both missing uh, people that are advertised uh, on the internet. Uh, I believe neither of them have been found. Um, so these are from uh, Trace Labs cases. And I decided to uh, leave the information in, in clear text because you could do the same thing. and, and figure out the same information online without any privileged information. And uh, because it provided, it, it provides a little bit of a better training case. Uh, but please be respectful of these people. When I look into the background of missing people, it's rarely a good story. Uh, and uh, both the family and the person, if they come back, uh, get a lot of heat for having run away and so on. So please always, always treat these people with respect and uh, and don't bug them. All right. So the first one here is Mackenzie Ray Markin, um, who's a teenage runaway. Um, these uh, pictures are age progressed um, to 16 years. And what what we found with a lot of runaways is that they have a lot of different accounts. Uh, with different names uh, oftentimes. So here, um, this is the first name and then the last name of one of the parents, which isn't the same as the last name of, of the uh, search target here. So we were able to find the person that way. And so if we, uh, if we look at the, um, at the URL, you see yet another name. So this is another alias that's being used as the username on Facebook. So this is the name that you need to plug into the password reset function. So we take that name, we plug it in. Uh, you do the incognito uh, window, click on forgot account, and then enter that, that uh, username in that field. And then you get 
a masked email address and a masked phone number, right? And the picture and the name, we already knew because we knew the, the username. Okay, so um, with that partial email address, uh, we can now start guessing. And remember this number 54, because that's going to be uh, important for the, for the last two digits of the phone number. So we look at this, and the Facebook name is Mackenzie Doll, but we know her legal name is Mackenzie Markin. So this one's pretty easy to guess, right? It's not doesn't require Sherlock Holmes to figure this out. First, last, at yahoo.com. Now we need to verify this. So we go to the password reset function again, start over. And this time, instead of the username, Kat Walensky, we plug in Mackenzie Markin at yahoo.com, hit search. And uh, we get, we don't get the picture and the, the clear name this time because we started with an email address, right? So Facebook doesn't want to disclose that. Um, but we get the same number 54 for the last two digits of the phone number. So we're pretty sure that this is the same account that we were just looking at. Um, the second case that uh, I want to look at is uh, where you can actually use information across several accounts. So this is also a missing person that I believe hasn't been found yet. Um, and um, here, we're doing password resets on two profiles. We found a Facebook and a, and a Twitter. And you see that it says C last letter T at hotmail.com. And here it says CH stars, no last letter at H something. So we, we can kind of see, right? Same kind of length email address, seems to be the same email address. So we can infer that it's CH star, 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 star T at hotmail.com is the email address, right? And we've got the number 89 here. So, um, Took me a little bit of guessing because usually people use dots or underscores um, between first and last if there is an extra letter. Um, in this case, it was just a um, just a, a dash. Um, but we sorry, but we verified that and we got the same eighty nine as part of the email address. Um, sorry, as part of the phone number on Twitter. Uh, last example was Facebook, right? So this works across different sites as well. OK, so I promised you some tips for red teamers um, and some for blue teamers. Let's go to the red teamers first. And these might be more obvious, right? If you um, have an email address, you want to verify it, uh, you can go to some of these uh, password reset functions and see, is, is that email valid? Of course, there's a ton of other ways to also verify the email address. You can also use the Intel to map out services used by the organization. We talked mostly about, um, about um, uh, kind of consumer grade uh, systems, except maybe the payroll company, but it's mostly like uh, co consumer stuff. But I found also a lot of uh, big tech companies uh, that are used as uh, corporate SaaS solutions that have the same kind of issues. So if you want to, if, if you have a user in that organization or a bunch of users, you can try out uh, logging onto a central uh, SaaS platform and see if uh, the account exists with a work email address. And if you do that for two or three of your targets, you can be pretty damn sure that they're using a certain SaaS service. Um, so that helps you kind of map out what they're using, helps you with pretexting, maybe helps you with um, uh, phishing, also pretexting, right? But more importantly, if you're going after anybody um, with phishing or vishing, whether it's their uh, work email address or if that's in scope, also uh, their private email address, you can really tie an email address to a certain service. You will know if they go to a certain e-commerce site or if they have an account on a certain uh, payment site or payroll site or um, uh, office productivity site, right? 
And that way you can craft a much, much better phishing email that really hits home, right? So really, really useful for the pretexting. For blue teamers, when I looked at, you know, I looked at like 500 sites. Um, and, and so these are the things that, uh, that sprung out at me. Uh, for login pages, don't return a different message or user experience when the user is, uh, when the username or email doesn't exist versus when the password is wrong, right? And also don't flag, uh, we had the e-commerce site in the beginning where it flagged if the account existed uh, because the username and then the password are on different pages. So um, you should always let somebody go to the password page and then um and then at the end say hey username and or and or password were incorrect so same experience no matter where people enter for the password reset forms um don't uh, put in different messages when the user and email exists versus whether it doesn't um, this is really important. So what I usually did to test out the password resets, even if I didn't have an account on the site, uh, I, I went to the password reset, typed in you know, gibberish at gibberish.com, and hit password reset. And it said, if it said account doesn't exist, I have my answer. Right? There is a, a, an information leak in terms of um, what accounts exist versus don't. Because you might not have an account on all systems. Sometimes it's a hassle to sign up. Sometimes it's um, it's not possible to sign up if it's a closed community, right? Uh, so so this is a really quick check. So don't do that if you're setting up an application. Uh, don't return any customer data the user hasn't entered. Um, so if I give you my phone number, don't give me a mass email address. Those kind of things. And uh, also, regardless of whether the email is correct, display that you resent a link or code. So what I've seen oftentimes is um, a message that said, uh, thank you for resetting the password. If we have an account on file for this email address, we will send you a password reset link. Um, so that's, that's what I see as best practice. The sign-up forums, I think, are where you have the most information leaks. Um, here, uh, don't return a different message if the account exists already. Um, if the account exists already, maybe treat that as a, the same as a password reset. Just send, say, hey, you tried to sign up for this account. You actually already have an account for this site. Here's a password reset link. But don't give a different message if the account exists. Remember that it's not only OSINT that might be used for phishing and vishing and so on, but if uh, your applications, your, your key applications that you run as a business, uh, broadcast which accounts exist and which ones don't. Then you open up the door for account brute forcing. If I can first figure out what email addresses are there, and then I can try out different common passwords, uh, that that really opens the door for that. I do understand why some of these companies um, do it the way they do, because they're providing assistance to the user in a way that reduces burden on the help desk. So it absolutely is a trade-off between um, you know, usability and security. Um, but I encourage you to just be aware of the trade-off and then make a business decision. So all the resources. So first of all, be, before I forget, I want to thank uh, Chris Eng at Veracode for providing me feedback on the abstract uh, and, and outline of this presentation. Really appreciate that. He helped me make that better for a B-Sides audience. Um, in terms of resources, uh, Michael Basil is uh, kind of my go-to for anything OSINT. Um, he has fantastic resources. His book, Open Source Intelligence, uh, I, I've read front to back uh, several times. It's a really big book, so it's a bit of a commitment. Uh, Inteltechniques.com, his website, has uh, really good information. Um, if you know of the open source toolkit that he had on his website. That's no longer publicly available. But if you buy the open source intelligence book, he has a link to make that downloadable. The 
uh, Security, Privacy, and OSINT show is a podcast by Michael Basel, where he talks a lot about OSINT and also privacy, which is the other side of the coin. Uh, similarly, the OSINT Curious podcast, super good resource. Bellingcat as a website, this is more of a journalism website, but they do everything with OSINT. Fantastic work. I'm impressed every time I read an article by them. And they also have a toolkit that uh, shows some of the uh, things. Then conferences, Layer 8. Many of the people who organize B-Sides Boston also organize Layer 8. Highly recommend it if you're into social engineering and OSINT. The Recon Village at DEF CON is a good resource. And if you're in law enforcement, the NCPTF conference once a year uh, is uh, a really, really good uh, way to learn about OSINT and legal process. Uh, but it's uh, closed to the public. It's only available if you're in law enforcement or government. Glenn Devitt's got a really good OSINT course at Black Hat. And uh, if you are looking for an automated way to test password resets, uh, there is a, a GitHub um, repository by uh, a guy who calls himself Megados. Um, I don't know how to pronounce the project. Is it Holhi or Holehe? Or uh, if, if anybody has an answer to that, I'd really like to know. Uh, I don't think that uh, many of the password reset functions can be truly automated at scale. Some of them use captures. Some of them use several inputs and so on. I think it's going to be really difficult. Some of them use several screens. So um, you can automate it to some extent, but not, not fully, I believe. All right. Uh, that's it for the presentation. Um, I was rushing to get through it, um, but uh, it seems we have some time for questions. And by the way, this is my Twitter handle, of course, Chris underscore Kirsch. Uh, feel free to follow me. Uh, feel free to DM me. My DMs are open. Uh, or ask your question uh, right here in the chat. So Thank you so much, ready. Chris. That was a really fantastic presentation. I have to tell you, I laughed at the beginning when you mentioned you wanted to work for a fortune teller and carry right. out all of the, the heist movies. That's like my my dream as well. Um, I, I did I, give a talk at DEF CON last year. I think it was last year uh, on uh, how fortune tellers kind of like techniques of how you can pretend to be a fortune teller and lessons for social engineering. It's up on, you can find it. If you look for fortune telling, DEF CON, Kirsch, or uh, SE Village, you, you'll find that what talk. <laughs> Uh, so I'm, 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 you know, like I'm on my path there. <laughs> That's awesome. Everyone watching, I will try and find that for you and uh, share it in the Discord channel so that we can, <laughs> we can all geek out over that. I also wanted to say I cried when you were sharing some of the information about uh, the missing people. Just thank yeah. you for that work. It was really, uh, yeah, it just hit me. So, so thank you for that. Um, we don't have any any questions in the chat so far. I see some folks are typing, but related to the missing persons, I mean, with all that work that you've done, how have you been able to kind of separate the emotions around finding missing people from the work that you're doing? Um, so I, I think you just need to compartmentalize it, right? You, you go in, you, you, I, I do this work because I think it's good work, right? It's uh, It hopefully helps people. Um, and uh, we have actually in, in uh, I think, three, so twice when I was a contestant and once when I was a judge, we did find people and locate people. Um, wow. And uh, in some cases, you know, um, uh, one case where we found somebody, they had run away with a gang, um, so an uh, un underage girl who ran away with a gang. Um, so they're not in a good place now. Presumably, she wasn't in a good place at home either. Otherwise, she wouldn't have run away. Um, so, so that's something where we provided all of the information of where we think she is uh, to law enforcement. There was another case where um, the uh, an underage girl ran away, um, and she was hanging out with a 40-year-old tattoo artist with a lot of white supremacist postings on Facebook. Um, so that one we we handed in. Uh, we had one case where the person was officially missing. Um, but we could, we found her, 
uh, also underage girl. Uh, no, well, I think she was like on the verge of 18 or something. But she looked like she was in a good place. She had gotten married. She seemed to be happy. Uh, her dad had liked one of her recent postings. And so that one we didn't hand in um, because we, we thought, you know, looks like it might be an immigrant family. Maybe this is an ICE case. We, we don't want to mess up something, somebody who's, who's in a good place, right? Yeah. So you, you find very, very different uh, examples. Some, some uh, uh, cases that we looked at uh, underage girls that are either hanging out with people who are, um, as uh, one guy, <laughs> like one expression is like, who is an unlicensed pharmacist. And another girl, uh, another girl was kind of in in uh, illegal prostitution, underage prostitution. So these are cases where you really want to try and get them out, right? Their home might not be the right place, right. but where they are right now is also not the right place. So if you can get the authorities involved and maybe find a better home for them, that then at least they stand a chance, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that kind of ties into one question that did pop up from Jason H. He says, are the majority of these cases, like your examples, just to confirm these missing people are alive or somewhere? And it sounds like you actually hand off to law enforcement as well. Yeah. yeah. So uh, so the uh, in the Trace Labs competitions, uh, they have a platform where you submit all of your findings for points. Right, and then you get bragging rights at the end. It's not for for any rewards or anything. Uh, and uh, these results are then aggregated and handed over to uh, law enforcement. In one case, um, at the NCPTF conference, we ran a Trace Labs competition where we had direct access to the law enforcement case officer. It was also a smaller competition. And one case that I worked on, we actually had uh, a, a patrol car outside the house where we thought the, the missing person was before the end of the competition. So that yeah. was super interesting yeah. because normally for, for the trade, to be honest, for the trade labs competitions, you hand over the information and that's it. You don't ever hear back. Um, you know, sometimes you hear, um that a person has been found like sometimes if, if there was a case that that we didn't solve but i'm interested in like how it how it ends if there's any new information i put out a google alert on the, that person's name and uh so i i get an update when they've been found or when there's any new information um uh, yeah uh, but sometimes it's a dead end you know it's it's, yeah. it's really teenagers uh and younger people are easier because they have more of a social uh, media footprint. Um, people in their 20s and 30s have usually more breach data available that you can leverage. Um, breach data is not like a, a, a paid for dehashed account would not be admissible for a trace labs case, right? As for points, you can submit it without points uh, if you find a password or find more information. But if you uh, take dehash, for example, without uh, login, or you go to uh, a darknet site and find, uh, you know, search for a name and it says, yes, we have information on this email address, there is a breach, but you don't have the password, that's allowed if you didn't pay for the information, right? That's that's the uh, the important thing for the Trace Labs competition. Don't pay and don't alert the target or the, uh, or the family. Right. So what recommendations do you have for the average user to protect themselves so that some of these OSINT techniques don't work? Sure, yeah. So I actually, uh, I'm probably like through this work a little bit on the paranoid side of things. <laughs> um, there is a Boston no, company. none of us are. <laughs> <laughs> there is a Boston company called Abine, A-B-I-N-E, and they have a service called Blur. Uh, Blur is a service. There's a paid version and a free version. I think the email masking is part of the free version uh, where you, uh, let's say you're signing up for Facebook, right? You can right click in the email field and say, um, generate a masked email address. And what it will do is it will generate a random string at 
opaque.com, which is one of their domains. They have about five or six domains that you can choose from. And then you use that. And when you uh, get an email from Facebook, it forwards it uh, to your regular email address. So you don't have to maintain a gazillion accounts. It just forwards the email. And if you re uh, happen to reply to that email, then it also masks it and makes it look as if it came from the masked email address. right? So what I'm doing is I just like any account I sign up for, I use a blur email address. And that means uh, a few things. Number one, the email address can no longer be used as a pivot point. Number two, it's really hard to guess the email address from a masked email if it's just a, a number of random strings that I only use for that domain. right? And the third thing that I really like is um, I can now freely sign up for all sorts of sites, even if I just want to use them for five minutes. Because at the header of, of each of those blur emails, what you get is a you know basically stop forwarding me the messages that come into this email address, right? Oh wow. So, so that you know a lot of people have like a spam email address, but if uh, one of those sites doesn't honor unsubscribes or uh, or, or is breached and you get like a whole lot of spam from like the mass spammers, then it's really hard to shut that down. But because you're compartmentalizing every site with a different email address, you can just selectively shut down those email addresses. So I highly recommend it. Um, and they also have have some other other cool stuff. Um, so for example, they have a service that uns like that takes you out of many of the public databases like white pages and, and those kind of things. I've done that manually. It's a ton of work. Um, you can pay them. They do it for you. Um, so those are some of the OSINT tips. Yeah. Now we just need them to have a bug bounty so that they can harden their own security posture. Yeah. We can't have yeah. them getting hacked. <laughs> yeah. And also, if people are interested, if you, I wrote an article on Medium with all of my kind of like identity theft and and privacy tips. Um, if you Google Medium Kirsch identity theft, I think you should find it. And it's basically 10 or 12 different things that I recommend people do. Uh, the blur email addresses are in there. Um, the uh, Another service I, I love to use is privacy.com. You hook that site up to your checking account, and you can generate a different uh, credit card for each site. And it doesn't actually cost you money uh, to do that. Um, Really, really helpful. And so you can say, I have one one uh, credit card for Netflix, one credit card for Hulu, one credit card for my insurance, a car insurance or something, right? And uh, you can put in maximum amounts per month, per year. You can do a single charge if it's a website that you only want to use once. And once the card is being used by for the first transaction, it gets locked to that vendor. So let's say I put in my card number with Netflix, and they charge that account once. And then Netflix gets breached, uh, and the, the um, uh, card number gets stolen. That card number will not work with any other vendor. Like if somebody's trying to buy something on eBay, it will not work because it's, it's, it's locked into Netflix. Super, super cool service. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's it's nice to know that there are a bunch of services out there to protect us because I think all of us uh, need to be paranoid and um, clearly like hearing some of your OSINT, set, OSINT techniques, a lot of them were new to me as well. So it just terrified me that much more. To be <laughs> <honest>. Yeah, <laughs> this was just like a super small part of the, the techniques we use on the uh, on on those kind of cases, right? Excellent. Chris, I I really appreciated your talk. I, I could ask you questions so much more, um, but we do have to wrap up. I really appreciate, again, all the information you shared today. Shout out to Layer 8 as well. Um, I threw the links for the cold reading techniques uh, DEF CON talk in the chat on Discord, as well as the Medium article. Is there any awesome. last, like words of wisdom or parting advice that you would want to give us? No, all good. Thanks for having me. I'll be in the Discord channel for a little bit uh, in case anybody has questions. And you can also DM me on Twitter. I will be available on uh, Discord for question answer. And this is bibliography. Thank you so much.
थैंक यू सो मच एवरीवन